You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Well, folks, <laughs> it is absolutely amazing. Trockman's at it again. from this issue of Veritas. The reason I'm going to do it, it will become obvious to you right off the bat. And uh, then maybe you'll get your heads together. You see, we had reports this afternoon from scared people all over the country that a great army was coming from the state of Washington to attack Montana. <laughs> And that two congressmen of Montana had resigned and left Washington and were on the way to Montana because of this invasion. Well, we checked with Washington. Nobody has resigned. Nobody. We were listening as the radio programs went along, and the same person kept appearing on different radio programs throughout the afternoon and evening. The story changed from resigned to, oh, uh, coincidentally, they're coming back on the same plane, and that's never happened before, so it must mean we're being invaded. I got one word for you, John Trockman. Bullshit. I want to read to you one of our stories from this issue of Veritas. And I want everybody out there to pull their head out of the orifice and start thinking correctly. This is from uh, page 9. I believe. Militias and patriots terrorized in joint United States and British PSYOPs exercise exclusive to the Kaji News Service. Confuse and decimate, divide and conquer the core strategy of kings and generals from the beginning of man's manipulation of humankind right up to the present day. There are no leaks, no vacations were canceled, no leaves were recalled, Rumors abound. 
March brought stories of a planned attack by federal agents and military forces upon patriot and militia organizations. The tales spread like a prairie fire in a brisk wind, fueled by phone trees and reams of fax paper, the gasoline of the militia of Montana and the Patriot Fax Network. Cinders wafted high upon a fool's breeze, searching for tender ears to burn. Calls bombarded radio talk shows. Airwaves were rife with speculation and predictions of Armageddon on March the 24th and 25th. The smoke from these fires was fear. It hung low to the ground and gathered in pockets, clouding minds and affecting judgment. It stank. The craziness reached its zenith, a conflagration, when a respected publication, Strategic Investment, Volume 10, Number 4, dated March 22, 1995, printed the following two paragraphs in the column Behind the Lines by Jack Wheeler. The slaughter of dozens of women and children in Waco by government stormtroopers under the command of Field Marshal Reno may pale in comparison to what has been planned for late March. A nationwide BATF FBI assault on private militias as the prelude to a possible declaration of martial law throughout the United States. All leaves and vacations have been canceled for BATF FBI personnel and for various state police and National Guard, such as California's. The Army's infamous Joint Task Force 6, which did the training for Waco, has been training BATF jackbooters with Bradley assault vehicles at Fort Bliss, Texas. Government agent provocateurs are set to plant fully automatic and heavy weapons like rocket launchers on the property of militia leaders. Every militia in the country, and there are dozens, many of which are well armed and well led by former or even active duty officers, is on a state of red alert. Should Reno be stupid enough to actually attack them militarily, there is going to be a lot of blood. The established media is programmed to immediately thereafter thunderously bellow for nationwide gun confiscation and even martial law. The Senate Armed Forces Committee has been alerted and is questioning key defense and justice people behind closed doors. Hopefully, Reno's Waco can be stopped in time, but that it was planned in the first place should be a sobering lesson as to what a horrifying event liberalism the political philosophy of the administration and the Democratic Party has been converted into a close cousin of fascism. The editors of Strategic Investment include Knight Templar, the Right Honorable Lord Rees Mogg of England's MI6, and Knight Templar William E. Colby of the Central Intelligence Agency, amongst others. This publication and several others, Soldier of Fortune, comes to mind has been used several times in the past in this manner. You could say that strategic investment is an asset to the company. Without the ability to gather and assess this kind of information, the sheeple went berserk and insanity became the rule. A few of us shoveled reason onto the flames, valiantly trying to put them out. Reason failed. If this is the response of patriots and militia to obvious rumor, and it is, what does it tell us about our leadership? What have we taught the enemy? What can we expect from the militia if we have to fight? How will we respond in the future? As an ex-member of Naval Security and Intelligence, the Office of Naval Intelligence, ONI, the Intelligence Briefing Team of the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, with the Secondary Naval Enlisted Code of Internal Security Specialist 9545, I can assure you that this was a planned psychological warfare exercise produced by several counterintelligence organizations of the United States government in full cooperation with British intelligence. You will remember they worked together to accomplish the Waco massacre. The primary mission was to create terror in patriots and their families. The secondary mission was to monitor the preparedness and response of patriots and militia to the perceived threat of imminent attack by a superior force. The only militia which reacted properly was the Second Continental Army of the Republic, 
This was predictable since it is the only militia with a superior intelligence gathering and analysis capability. Analysis revealed the source and purpose of the exercise. The rumors were designed to provoke a readiness response and reveal strategic operational readiness plans of specific militia units. The intelligence service took advantage of this opportunity to assess the response of militias outside the command of the 2nd Continental Army of the Republic and the counterintelligence and psychological warfare capabilities of the enemy. This analysis was relayed to the command staff who reviewed the information. The commanding general ordered the army to stand down and ignore the rumors. The assessment of the intelligence service and the decision of the command staff was relayed to the listeners of the hour of the time. The flames withered and died, but the embers glowed just beneath the ashes, waiting for a splash of gasoline. Some bright morning, I will enter the office, see a pile of fax paper covering the floor, the large black letters, MOM, staring up at me. There will be 20 or 30 messages on the answering machine, and the sheeple will stampede once more. Chased by the flames of rumor, fueled by the ringing phones and reams of fax paper, blinded by the smoke of fear. Phones are open, folks. 602-337-2524. That's 602-337-2524. Talk about anything you like. The paper has been put to bed. It goes to press tomorrow. Good evening. You're on the air. Hello. This is Jeffrey from New Orleans with an update on HCR 13 in Louisiana. Great, Jeffrey. Let's hear it. Okay. The state of Louisiana legislature is doing the Pennsylvania two-step. They have adjourned for the weekend after having debate yesterday. Bird Society members and other groups, libertarians, constitutionalists, etc., have bombarded the legislature with heavy, heavy lobbying to the point that Pepe Blue and his people were trying to get on the air to try to mollify uh, the opposition, but they failed in New Orleans heavily. Other parts of the state are really pushing on the uh, on the legislature, and we're going to have to wait next week till the final results. Great. The headline story in this issue of Veritas concerns the Council 
or the conference of, uh, of the states, and uh, it's really, really going to open a lot of eyes. Uh, well, you were already going to it yesterday. That's correct. So, uh, so we, we're going to keep on seeing what happens in other states, but so, but so far it's, they're really getting a stonewall in Louisiana. We'll see what happens next week. Okay, we got to hit Indiana now. Indiana is the hot spot, folks. If you live in Indiana, you've got to start pounding on your state legislator's desks and on the committee members' desks, and you have to send faxes and phone calls, and people tell them what you think, but be polite. Also, in this issue of Veritas, you'll find a clip-out that you'll all want to use in this battle. It will give you a lot of strength. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Good night. 602-337-2524 is the number. That's 602-337-2524. Good evening. You're on the air. Uh, good evening, Bill. Tom from Indiana. Hello, Tom. I had a couple of questions for you. I've been rereading the... Uh the uh, uh, the protocols in your book, mm -hmm. and there's something in there that didn't sit well with me, and that was that if the protocols were supposedly written in the uh, all the time around the, the was, late 1700s, it's been written and revised and all kinds of things. Okay, so the, the thing that uh, it was converted into a play at one time. It's uh, the the uh, references to Marxism and Darwinism, yes, you know, obviously didn't occur till what the 1850s. That's right. And so you're saying that it's just that's part of the revision process. Oh yes. Okay. It, it's it's been revised many times. The first um, knowledge of the protocols of uh, Zion, it really should be Sion, S I O N, instead of Zion. And uh, anybody who reads it who understands the Jewish people and their religion and their culture. Uh, we'll see instantly that it was not written by the Jews. Obviously. But it has certainly been used to persecute the Jews. Uh, the first instance of uh, any recorded knowledge of any portion of the protocols was when the Bavarian Illuminati uh, was discovered to be plotting against the monarchs of Europe right. and was, in fact, destroyed. They found complete passages verbatim from what we now know as the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, it really should read the Protocols of Wise Men of Sion, and uh, it does not have a Jewish origin. Would you say that uh, it's possible that the writers of that might have also been uh, people known as the Sons of Cain, or would you? Would oh, absolutely. You see, one of the one of the things that's really really will strike you when you get into this is that uh, the, the the main battle seems to be a religious one between those who believe in the in the uh, <laughs> In the, uh, uh, the the salvation by works, right. okay. And the other ones are the salvation by faith. In other words, between water and fire. One of the goals of the secret societies that they have professed is to pour or cast what they call the molten sea, which is the mixture of the two into a homogeneous uh, substance where they will be able to live together uh, compatibly. And uh, and Lucifer will then be um, the king. Well, not, not only the king. There will be a reconciliation between Lucifer and Yahweh. Mm. Okay. Now, folks, I'm explaining something to you. It doesn't mean you have to believe it. Doesn't even mean I believe it. It's just what I've learned. Right. Okay. Uh, you know me. I don't like to preach religion to anyone. I believe, and, and I'll tell you why. Because a lot of people ask me, "Well, if you're a Christian, how come you don't spread the word?" Well, I think God gave us all a free will choice for a reason. And if you force someone to say that they believe something, because that's really what you're doing when you force someone. You see, they really don't believe it. They'll say they believe it to get you off their back or to get special favors or to get you to quit beating them. Uh, if, you, if you make them say they believe it and they really don't, then you haven't done anything except cast a shadow on your own soul. So it has to be a free will choice. People either have to accept whatever religion they accept or reject it, and they have to answer for that to to uh, whatever God there is. I happen to have my own personal beliefs about that, and many of you know what they are. So anyway, my my, my last question is: What was the name of that song you just played at, at, at the 15 minute mark? Oh, that was uh, Watermark. Okay, who's that by? Inya. Okay. I, I liked it. I wanted to find out what it was. <laughs> last night I asked if anybody knew what kind of music this was, and nobody called today, left a message or anything. But I'll, I'll, do you know what kind it is? Um, 
my brother has one of the one of the Enya's CDs, but I I don't I haven't listened to it. I'm not that familiar with Enya. Well, you know, a lot of people out there ask, "Do you know what this is? Do you know what this is?" And and a lot of them claim that this is the the superior music because it comes from the superior race. <laughs> huh. This is Celtic music. I'll be dying from the Celts. So, I thought everybody would find that interesting, and I like to, you know, I have an eclectic taste for music and like to play all of this stuff. But anyway, back to the original subject. Right. The people who are really practice the lies and, and the deception and the manipulation claim that they are Christians. If you were asked them, they would say that they're Christians, or if you would challenge them uh, that they're practicing the occult or that they worship Lucifer, they would point to their Bible on the altar and they would say, we're, we're really Christians, and, and it's a lie. They're really not Christians. And, uh, but it, you know, it wouldn't matter if they would be open with it. I, I believe everybody should have a free will choice, and that, that that is a personal thing between them and God. And they have to answer for whatever wrong choice they may make. Maybe we made the wrong choice. Nobody really knows until they're gone, until you die and you find out, see? That's right. So uh, that's why religion is based upon faith, and people spend their whole life trying to justify their faith, and that's where theology and dogma comes in. That's the result of this lifetime endeavor to justify whatever faith they believe in. But these people, they claim outwardly that, that they are the sons of Adam and that they believe uh, in Christ and that they are Christians. The truth is, in secret, they openly admit that they are the sons of Cain and that their God is Lucifer. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I, I have never taught to any of them, but reading the protocols and having studied the Bible uh, somewhat, it, it became obvious to me that that's who was probably doing the writing in those, in those protocols there. Yes, and it would surprise you um, to find out that it has more of a Christian-based origin than than anything else. The thing, the thing that was really a, a tip off to me was the fact that they uh, they do not imbibe alcohol. Yes. And if you look at uh, the thirty-fifth chapter of Jeremiah, I don't want to turn it into a Bible study, but there's also reference to that in the in the Bible. And right. So, That's correct. And folks, you'll find that Jews do imbibe in alcohol. It's a part of their ceremonial dinners on their holidays and all kinds of stuff. So. Uh, remember, our enemies practice deceit, yep. and it's a dreadful deceit, and, and even the elect shall, shall be swallowed up in this. And if it were possible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, well, it's been a pleasure talking to you, though. Thank you for calling. Thank you. And folks, regardless of what I may say, religious-wise in here, I'm responding to the questions of the callers. I'm not in any way trying to preach to you or tell you what to believe. I think that uh, we've all seen what that leads to. Just take a look at the history of the Dark Ages. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. This is uh, Tim in California. Hi, Tim. Hey, what's going on with the O.J. Simpson trial? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I why is I wouldn't, uh, I would... everybody but O.J. on trial? Why is what? Why is everybody but O.J. on trial? I don't understand what you mean. I'm, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to throw a curveball. I, have, huh? I don't watch it. Well, all I gotta say is that uh, everybody that takes the witness stand is on trial. You know, they're they're the credibility. They're that's that way in any trial. Yes. Whoever the opposition is has to discredit the witness in order to get the jury to believe whatever their side is, whether it's the prosecution or the defense. It doesn't make any difference. That's the part of the adversarial system, exactly. which, by the way, is all screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why is uh, everybody having to put up with that? You know, I mean, this is a trial. Everybody doesn't have to put up with it. The truth is, everybody loves it, or they wouldn't be watching it eight hours a day. Well, you know, no, that's a big, big misconception because the trial is now on national television. This is supposed to be some type of a trial that everybody in America is supposed to be watching to see. I got news for you. An awful lot of Americans are watching it. Exactly. But not for the reasons that you think. They're watching it because it's the greatest soap opera they ever saw. They don't give a damn about justice. Well, people in America think that is justice, is what they're seeing on American TV right now. That's You're exactly right. You know, and that's not the way it should be. That's you know, right. 200 years ago... You're right about that, too. 200 years ago, our forefathers 
uh, wrote a constitution. What? what? Did you say forefathers? You're out of here, bud. <laughs> you don't hey, cut you, me you off. know if you were going to the to the university that uh, oh. Donna Shalala was president of, that you would have been suspended for just saying the word forefathers? Okay. Excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> no, you can say it all you want on this show. It's food for my ears. I love it. Well, isn't that crazy? Yes, it is. Everything is crazy today. Everything's turned upside down and backwards. Yeah. Wrong is right and right is wrong. Yeah. Well, I think it's wrong that, that uh, an American people out there watching the trial on television are distracted from the facts. That's exactly what it's designed to do. No. Who designed it? It doesn't matter who designed it. That's exactly why it's happening. Well, you said it's designed. Well, who designed it? Have you, how long have you been listening to this broadcast? <laughs> well, you know, it's time that things... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now. You didn't answer my question. How long have you been listening to this broadcast? Well, probably only about two weeks now. Oh, uh, that's why. You see, we've covered that over and over and over and over again. And, and I'm not trying to insult you or make you feel bad, but I cannot teach the basics to the new listeners every night. The, 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 what's happening in this country is being brought about by a brotherhood. A brotherhood of adepts who practice an occult religion that goes all the way back to the ancient city of Babylon and has nothing to do with what you believe about God or religion or anything else. If they believe it, it will affect you. And that's what you have to understand. And there, it's not a conspiracy. Nothing is hidden. It's all out in the open, but you've got to dig for it. Yeah. And that's a sad truth. Yep. Sad truth. Hey, that's and, my uh, two cents, okay? Okay. Thank you for your two okay. cents. Okay. Good night. I hope I gave you two cents back in change. <laughs> uh, 602-337-2524. Good evening. You're on the air. Bill. Yes. Tom Russell. Yes, I'm in North Carolina. How you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, Brennan Roberts gave you a plug on his show the other night, by the way. Who? Brennan Roberts on Full Disclosure Live. He broadcasts at 8 o'clock on WWCR on Sunday nights. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway... Well, can you tell me about the John Birch Society? John Birch Society was founded by one Robert Welsh, who was a Freemason, uh, which uh, is very difficult to dig out, but we dug it out. The John Birch Society uh, keeps everybody stirred up and spinning around chasing their tail. However, if you attempt any action whatsoever, you will be slapped down hard by the John Birch Society. Uh, people like me and Linda Thompson and others who do, uh, who are active in trying to change things other than through the voting system are constantly uh, attacked by the John Birch Society. And uh, uh, their philosophy is that it all could be solved uh, through the vote. And, and I guess that's what I've come to conclude from speaking with them. Yes. But I have, I don't know how you dug this out, and I'd be interested to find out. I talked to the Scottish Rite of Northern Jurisdiction, Southern Jurisdiction, the York Rite of Freemasonry, and the Grand Lodge of North Carolina, and I can find no record of a Robert Henry Winborn Welch ever having been a Mason. Oh, they don't want you to know it, but you can dig it out if you dig hard enough. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to, to do it again for you. Uh, um, can you give me a starting point? No, you're just going to have to go out and dig. And you, got, you also have to remember... I've, that, that, I've spent three let, days at the library. Let's, and listen to me carefully. Yes. You have to remember that it's not just the name Freemason. Mm -hmm. All of these occult secret societies that call themselves brotherhoods or fraternal organizations are the same at the top, even though at the bottom they appear to oppose each other. And there are many, many of them. They go by many different names and many different occupations and... At times they appear to oppose each other when actually in reality they are of the same mind. They practice the Hegelian dialectic of political conflict resolution, and uh, they are all Freemasons. And do you have to know what degree he was? No, that I don't know. Okay, uh, because I cannot find anything referencing him. You weren't, listen you weren't listening to me, were you? Yes, I was, but... What I found out was he was in the candy manufacturing business until 1958 when he founded the John Birch Society because he believed the Bavarian Illuminati had infiltrated a certain part of Freemasonry. But I never could find any attachment 
of him to Freemasonry itself. And you weren't listening to me. You're still not listening. I don't understand what you're saying. I, I know you don't, but I haven't got time to teach you tonight. So you go and figure it out, okay? Okay. Good night. Thank you. This broadcast has done many, many hours, ladies and gentlemen, many, many hours on the subject, and I cannot repeat it every night. We have the tapes for sale. If you'll send in a self-addressed stamped number 10 size envelope and $1, we'll send you a tape list and a whole bunch of other information, and uh, you can pick out the tapes of the subjects that you like or that you need to know if you're starting from square one and uh, purchase those tapes. And listen to them and learn. The Mystery Babylon series is the best ever done in history on the subject. And there are a few mistakes in there, but not many. I guarantee you, if you can find a body of work that extensive anywhere else, I'll give you a set free. Good evening. You're on the air. Yes, Bill. Yes. I'm Vic McGee with the Constitution Party in South Carolina. Hi, right, Vic. And, uh, uh, I got, I got a good question for you, Bill. Sure. You going to run for political office with the Constitution Party? Never, ever. Never, ever, ever, or never, never? Never, ever. I am a messenger. My job is to educate and deliver a message. Okay. And that's I'm... where my skills are. That's where I am at my best. That is what is needed probably more than anything else in this country. Your, your listeners will know in the North and South Carolina that uh, we're going to be having that meeting in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and the, most, uh, the North Carolina state organ, organizer, and, and uh, I'll be there also. So let you know, most states, they can come to it in Rock Hill, South Carolina on April the 1st. And they can call my home phone number, 803-684-3155, to get the... Okay, say the phone number again slowly. 803-684-3155. That's not slowly. Do it once more. <laughs> I'm sorry. 803 <laughs> Six eight four three one five five. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. There was another uh, famous person who founded a religion in this country who was also a Freemason, and that organization has taken great pains to hide it. But if you uh, study the beginnings of the of the uh, organization, if you read the speeches that this man gave. If you go and look at the memorial that was made to him near the site where he was buried, you'll see that he was also a Freemason. And the organization is Jehovah's Witnesses, and the man's name is Russell. Good evening. You're on the air. I got an interesting statistic for you. I went into Barnes & Noble the other day with a friend of mine. I had ordered your book, and uh, he couldn't wait for me to get it, so he wanted to see if Barnes & Noble carried it. So we walked in, and we went to look for your book, and... Um, you know, we we went to the section that they they supposedly kept it at. We couldn't find it, so we asked the guy where it was. New Age. Well, you, no, well that doesn't that, that doesn't even matter. We asked the guy where it was. He went and got it for us, and we said, well, why, why don't you know? Why don't you have the book? Well, you know, what, I mean, why why don't you have it out? He says, well, this is the most stolen book that we carry. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. it was, uh, that's why I figured I went over to call you to let you know that. The most stolen book, huh? That's the most shoplifted book from Barnes & Noble. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. I, 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 was, I also picked up those books um, that you had recommended last week uh -huh. on the uh, you know the other Freemason books, Knight Templar, and all that really good stuff. Yeah, it is. Oh, my God. But, I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, you really, really got to dig through that stuff. And what I like about it is that some of it, um, they, they, they talk about it from the perspective of the Masons and of the secret societies. Not all of it is written against it. So, you, you know, you kind of see, you have right. to see the handwriting on the wall. Yeah. You have to remember that after Robinson wrote uh, Born in Blood, uh, he was inducted into Freemasonry and now speaks on their behalf and, and doesn't expose them anymore. Did you mention that? that? That's pretty amazing, actually. Oh, it's not amazing at all, you see. Uh, they gain a lot of their converts when uh, when you try to deal with the public and find out that they're right about most of the public being sheep or cattle, uh, not literally, but uh, you know figuratively. Yeah. And, and so once once you're dealing with the public and you find that out, you're fair game to be recruited by the enemy because you don't want to be on the losing team. I've been approached many times by them, and I, I've got to tell you the truth. Many times I was sorely tempted, but. Uh, all I got to do is, is is look at my family or my daughter or you know somebody that I really love and it brings me right back. 
Well, it's always very seductive. I mean, it's a, like you said, everybody loves a mystery, but it's not just a mystery. The problem is, is that there are so many people that are preoccupied with owning and controlling power over other people, not just personal powers in their own lives. That's right. If you're one of them, they make sure that your life is easy and that you are rewarded, and uh, if you have talent, you go right straight to the top. See, there's one thing that the Masons forget, though. Historically, um, the people that put Hitler into power, for example, um, Hitler turned right against them as soon as he had power. So did Stalin. You know why? Yeah, because they're the ones. They put him in power. They know how he got there, and they yeah, and, right. and they have all the all the juice on him. They knew how they got there. They understood the Hegelian dialectic. They know synthesis, or thesis, uh, antithesis, and uh, synthesis. And so uh, once they got there, they turned around and got rid of the people who put them there because they didn't want to be threatened by the same organization. Absolutely. The same thing happens with socialism. When socialism comes to power, the first people they get rid of are the people that put them there, and they're usually the intelligentsia, the university professors, the people mm -hmm. who, 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 who can uh, think and, and write and, and do great things with their mind are the first ones to go. And unfortunately, they haven't realized uh, uh, how to use their mind enough to read history and figure that out yet. All these university professors that are help bringing Marxism and socialism into America will be the first ones that the Marxist socialists destroy once they come to power because they know that those people, the intelligentsia, will be the first one to figure out that it's all a scam when they see it in action. Absolutely. I got, I got another question for you. I'm also doing some research into the ADL. I ordered the book, The Ugly Truth, about the ADL. Uh -huh. um, now, I'm hitting a brick wall, and I'll tell, I'll tell you why, because the material that I'm coming across, and like, you, know, you know how you say not to believe you, and I, I agree with that 100%, but I have the taste, I taped your uh, series on the ADL, and the only thing is I'm, tr I'm hitting a brick wall as far as referencing it. My fr a friend of mine is Jewish, and he gets very offended when I even talk about the ADL and whatever they do, and I can't... That's because he's a victim. Victims like to be victims. They don't like like anything that threatens that. Agreed. I can't come up with any proof, though. My, in other words, I know what you're saying, and I, I, I've heard the stories of them painting swastikas on Jewish graves to try and foment racial tension and all that. But how do you... See, he's got all kinds of books that link the it, age with all kinds of benevolent good causes. And when I mentioned... Oh, yeah, that's like Freemasons. The first thing that, you, that happens when you try to expose them is they point to the Shriners Hospitals for Children and say, see, we're not bad guys. Exactly. But that stuff I could link up. I have all the literature, because a lot, and most of this stuff is very well documented. But unfortunately, the, what I've been able Maybe you can point me in the right direction. And I yeah, I sure can. Go to Dope Incorporated. Go to The Ugly Truth About the ADL. All your leads are in there. All you have to do is follow them up. If you're having trouble, go to the Executive Intelligence Review, which is one of the best research organizations in the world. Forget about their politics. Right, right. I agree. And, uh, and they will help you also. And how do I get in touch with the, uh, well, I guess, I guess once I get, I guess once I get my book, the, uh... The address is right in there. So, yeah, because that, that's great. You, listen, man, you are doing a fantastic job, and I really enjoy listening to your program. I video, I actually videotape the audio on your program, because I don't have enough cassette tapes to put the information on. Okay, when you play it back, will you call me and tell me what you see? Oh, you don't think, wait, what, what you It's see? a joke, it's a uh, joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm, I'm just kidding too, but... Listen, man, seriously, um, keep doing what you're doing and uh, keep the faith. And uh, if you're ever in New York City, look me up. I gave my address and my phone number to one of the uh, to one of the people in your offices. And if you ever need anything, if you ever need any kind of information out of the city that maybe only can be gotten from the city, I don't know, you know, or you need a place to stay if you stay if you're ever down here. Can you send me some sleep? That's what I really need. Send me some sleep. <laughs> right, that I can't help you with, bro. Well, I'm going to get it tomorrow. We'll all be okay, Well, you're done with your newspaper for, the, for, the, for the, this issue, right? No, i got to start on the next issue now. <laughs> oh, come on. I mean, you're not going to say, you said you were going fishing yesterday. I am going fishing. Well, okay, so go fishing, come, relax, maybe, you know. Tomorrow I'm going to sleep where the boys take the, the paper to Gallup uh, to get it printed, and uh, I'm going to sleep. And you know, I don't have to tell you to not forget about your wife and kids. you got to spend some time with them. Yes, that's right. By the way, I saw a picture of your family in, the, uh, in your book, and you have a beautiful family. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot, now for everything, and I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for calling. <laughs> All right, bye. I love those kind of calls. I mean, that was a pleasant conversation, and, you know, even if he had been critical, it was a pleasant, he was a pleasant guy. You know, that's, it doesn't matter what you say when you're pleasant. Uh, I, I don't understand why people can't uh, do that. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening, Bill. Hey, we are happier in clams to see your book on the shelves at Walden Books in Pennsylvania. You're kidding. 
Unbelievably so. Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine in the military found it and said, uh, you know, this is the stuff you're always talking about. And I said, wait a minute, what book is it? He said, Behold a Pale Horse. And I said, wait a minute, Cooper's? And he said, sure. So uh, I wasn't able to get away at the time, so he ran in and got another copy. Well, I'm flabbergasted. You know, when that, when that book was first printed, everybody called me a nut, uh, some kind of a CIA saboteur, a liar, a... Uh, a conspiracy uh, wacko theorist and all this kind of stuff and uh, nobody would touch my book with a 10-foot pole and now I'm hearing that it's the most stolen book from Barnes & Noble I heard that too, that's interesting I love the book, I'm about a third of the way through and I'm going to tell you what, it's an eye opener every page uh, well, what saved the book and what saved me was everything that I wrote about in there that uh, nobody believed could ever happen happened <laughs> Absolutely. And and that's another there's, scary thought. And there's a lot I said would happen that hasn't happened yet. One other matter. Um, there was a newspaper article in the Harrisburg Patriot uh, regarding the uh, rally at the state capitol on... Uh, yeah, they think it was for Monday. And uh, when we found out that they adjourned the legislature, we changed it to the following Wednesday. So exactly. the stupid reporter showed up on Monday and then wrote an article saying that I was a wacko conspiracy theorist nut. And since nobody showed up, so much for shortwave uh, talk radio. <laughs> right. Well, you know, we uh, kind of tracked that down a little bit. She's normally the police reporter. And uh, don't, don't don't let her bullshit you. She's a wacko socialist. Hey, I that she wrote that. that article from her head intentionally to discredit everything. She did no research, nothing. Well, she claims that someone gave her about a five-minute segment of a tape of yours. Oh, she listened to. I could show you five minutes of anybody talking and make you oh, think make you think they're crazy. In fact, I can take five minutes of you talking without your knowledge and make everybody think that you're nuts. Oh, I'm sure. What what I was trying to say is that uh, we up here think that uh, that tape and that story may have it was either planted uh, ADL wise or else it came from someone within the police department. Oh well, I don't know where it came from, but it definitely has the ADL slant to it. Absolutely, there is no doubt about that. That there was uh, somebody who works for the ADL involved in that. But uh, what you should do, all of you in that area, is as soon as you get your copy of Veritas, mm -hmm. take it in there and say, you know something? You have the audacity to call yourself the Patriot newspaper. This Absolutely. is a real newspaper. You know, Absolutely. You, you've got nothing but uh, but uh, trash. I'll tell you what, Bill. I... And, 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 and give them a copy. Absolutely. I am in love with your book, and uh, I'm using it uh, to dispute the naysayers right and left, and uh, I'm just glad you wrote it. It, uh, it was definitely a surprise to see it and see all the things that you've been talking about, or at least a good portion of them, uh, come to light right on the pages. Uh, you have the sources there, so you can go out and, so that I can go out and look it up and even pull copies of the documents that you used. And uh, it's very hard for somebody to refute your argument when you have that kind of material there. Yeah, that's that's true. Well, keep up the good work, Bill. Is there going to be a sequel? Uh, I'm working on two books. When they're done, I'll let you know. Super deal. I look forward to it. Good okay. luck to you. Are you subscribing to Veritas? No, I've been uh, stitching it from a friend. So uh, that means I've got to subscribe. you got to support us, man. you got it. If, if we don't get enough subscribers, it ain't going to last long because we're sending out thousands of copies to people who don't pay who we know have to see it. I agree. So, oh, you got another one here, so I'll be calling your offices in the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and good night to you. Good night. 602-337-2524 is the number. Boy, it's a nice, pleasant evening for conversation. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening, Bill. Can you tell me what uh, number of the Veritas that you just uh, put to bed? Is that the third or the second issue? Second. So, okay, good. I was worried. I got the first issue and have <laughs> been wondering or afraid that I'd miss the second. Oh, no. If you got the first one, you know you're going to get the second one. Well. The only ones who, who uh, will have a cutoff are CAGI members who will run out after number four who are getting it simply because they're CAGI members. No, my, my concern is with the post office's ability to mangle and uh, mutilate. Oh, I understand that. Well, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. We've been very lucky so far, folks. We uh, haven't lost anything through the post office so far that we can tell. We've had some people who didn't get theirs because of mistakes we made, and we rectify it, and uh, we got it out to them, and that's no problem. 
Uh, if you uh, sent your money in late or something like that, don't call me and say, well, you didn't, you didn't get mine. You didn't get yours because you sat on the fence waiting to see what it was going to be like before you sent your money in, and uh, there weren't any left. That first uh, printing, it went to the last copy, folks. I've never seen anything like that before in my life. I mean, usually, no matter what you print, you have some left over. We didn't have anything left over. Good evening. You're on the air. Yeah, Bill. Uh, in regards to a caller that you had a while ago where he was doubting uh, Robert Welch being a Freemason, let me tell you what happened. Back in 1980, uh, I was living up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and uh, a friend and I, uh, Charlie O'Brien, wrote uh, Robert Welch. And I told Welch at the time, who was, of course, still alive in 1980, I said, you know, you've done a great job over the years of exposing the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations, but why haven't you... Now, by the way, I am an ex-Mason. I got into and out of Freemasonry in 1980 when I saw what was going on. Mm -hmm. But I said to Welch, I said, why is it you haven't exposed the working class arm of the conspiracy, which is Freemasonry? So he had his uh, assistant, Gary Handy, write me back a letter making all kinds of apologies for the Masons and saying, oh, no, they're definitely anti-communist and this and that. So then Charlie and I turned around and sent him a Xerox copy from Mackey's Revised Encyclopedia of Freemasonry dated 1929, where under I for Illuminati and under W for Weishaupt, they told you what a wonderful guy Adam Weishaupt was and what a wonderful organization the Illuminati was, that it was designed you know, to combat moral evil and all this other garbage. And I asked Welch and Gary Handy to explain to me how can you uh, tell the whole world uh, how Weishaupt and the Illuminati were basically the foundation of modern-day communism from May of 1776, and then on the other hand, make excuses for the Masons who try to tell us what wonderful people uh, Weishaupt and Baron von Knieg were and what a wonderful group the Illuminati was. Well, he never could or never would answer the question. So I would think you, you might say in a de facto way that Robert Welch answered to me back in 1980 the fact that he was at least an apologist, if not an outright Mason. Of course. And, and that's why the, uh, the John Burke Society doesn't expose any of that now. And I was in the Burke Society also for a few years before I woke up to the fact that although they have a lot of great educational materials, a lot of great books and things like that, you know, to really get you up to speed on a lot of things, what they seem to do at the meetings, the only thing they seem to do at the meetings is have letter-writing campaigns like that's going to solve our problems. Yeah. You know, write a letter to your congressman, write a letter to your senator, and meanwhile this guy's pitching him in file 13. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reason for all that is is it makes the, the people who could do something think that they are. Well, also, I think what it's doing, whether whether most people realize it or not, is getting a lot of good patriotic names on a centralized list and making that list available to whoever, whenever the night of the long knives occurs in this country, as it did in Nazi Germany in 1934. Don't ever worry about that. There's only one list, and if you're not one of them, you're one of us, and that means you're on it. Well, I'm on I'm on the list, I guess, so, you know, who cares, but... Uh, I think it's it's nice for people to know exactly where Robert Welch came from. And, of course, uh, Joseph Smith uh, was also, you were mentioning that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, were, were Masonically inspired. And wait a minute, Joseph, so was Joseph Smith, and so was his successor, uh, Brigham Young. Uh, Smith had been a Mason for years whenever he was asked to start forming Masonic lodges uh, there, you know, to get in with the uh, Mormon Church. Now, wait a minute. That's not quite true. Joseph Smith was not a Mason before he founded the Mormon Church. His brother was. He became a Mason later. Are you sure about that? Because in, it seems like in the Book of Mormon, he's got a lot of a lot of phrases in there that are Masonic. I mean, a lot of so-called inspiration. Yes. It is very, very definitely Masonic. That's true. But there's a, there's enough wrong without making things up. He he was not a Freemason himself, or at least we cannot find any record of it until much later. His brother, however, was a Freemason uh, before uh, and during the time that. Uh, that Joseph Smith supposedly met the angel in, in the woods and, and found these tablets. Yeah, well, you know, because uh, one of the references there under Christ in the Book of Mormon, uh, Smith uh, has a uh, liking uh, referring to Christ, uh, basically comparing him to the serpent. And, of course, the serpent is Satan, not Jesus. But well, uh, look in the Book of Mormon. You can find some pretty weird well, things there. I have, but you have to understand what I'm about. I'm not about tearing down somebody else's religion. I don't care what anybody else believes. 
I only get involved when they're trying to either force their belief onto me or other people and we don't want it, or they're trying to manipulate us or change our form of government or, or take our liberties away from us. Yeah. If they're not bothering us in, in any way like that, then I don't really care what they worship or how they worship or anything else. And we've explored the Mormon angle on here in specific relationship to Bo Grice running around the country lying about his religion uh, and, and telling people he was a Christian and getting in with Christian identity groups when, when the reality was he was a Mormon. And there was nothing wrong with him being a Mormon if he had been honest about it and told people. Yeah. But he didn't. He lied about he it. He is always in short supply these days. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, and besides that, I know an awful lot of good people who belong to all these different religions who are not trying to hurt anybody and just trying to live like me and you and everybody else and, and have a good life. Yeah, it's, it's I, the leaders that 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 are doing all this crap, and and uh, no matter no matter what it is. You know, my basic philosophy is no matter what the religious beliefs are. Uh, is basically I, I try to avoid any religion that allows its members to become uh, members of the Masonic Temple because having been in that organization and knowing what an evil organization it is you know when they, they ask you things like are, are you a, uh, a Royal Ark Mason I think that's 26th degree are you a Royal Ark Mason and the guy answers I am that I am mm -hmm. which is a blasphemy uh, and then in the uh, Rose Croix degree you know, he confirms the order by order of Akil's deck, uh, like he, you know, he's God uh, confirming Jesus. And uh, then, of course, in the entered apprentice degree, which everyone has to go through the first degree, what was then told you that my throat will be cut from ear to ear, my tongue torn from its roots, my body buried a cable toes length from shore where the tide has enclosed twice in 24 hours. Should I ever attempt to reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry unlawfully to anyone, so help me God and keep me steadfast. Mm -hmm. If that isn't a pagan ritual, I don't know what is. Well, of course it is. <laughs> it comes from, uh, well, if, if you go back far enough with every religion there is, you'll find paganism somewhere in it, and that includes the Christian religion, specifically after the Council of Nicaea in 300-something A.D., uh, when Constantine uh, merged the uh, the uh, sun uh, worshippers with the Christian Church, but uh, anyway, and of course, you know, the best expose I think I've ever seen on the boot tube about Freemasonry was an Ed Bradley report on 60 Minutes years ago when they showed about the uh, kidnapping and murder of Roberto Calvi, who had embezzled 3.2 million dollars from his bank, uh, Banco Ambrosiano, in Milan, Italy for the Masonic P2 Lodge, mm -hmm. and when he was out on bail, he mysteriously disappeared from the land, and when he popped up again, he had called his wife from London. They found him hanging from Blackfire's bridge. Yeah, but before, the, the night before they found him hanging, uh, he called his wife and said, you know, well, I'm having some difficulties, but I, I think it's going to be all right. You know, I'm going to be able to get out of this thing and this and that. Don't worry, I should be home soon. And the next morning they found him hanging from the Blackfriars Bridge where the tide went up to his knees twice in 24 hours. It was a r ritualistic Masonic uh, execution simply because he had be become an embarrassment to the order. Right. You're absolutely correct. So, Bill, have a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And good night. 602-337-2524. Well, that's a man who's done his research. <laughs> that's for sure. Not many people recognize the hanging of Calvi from the Blackfriars Bridge as a Masonic execution. And, uh, of course, you wouldn't unless you had studied it. But uh, <laughs> all of you who haven't, go back and look at the way that he was hanged, and you'll see. Good evening. You're on the air. Oh, uh, say I was just down your neck of the woods there a couple of weeks ago, passing on uh, Interstate 44, going west. Um, I know you were talking last night about uh, the uh, uh, the Waco raid. Uh huh. I think that really shows a weakness in the Patriot movement that should be uh, looked at, uh, and that is that they're they're they prepared for the confrontation. They, um, I think they tried to prepare themselves psychologically and, and, and everything else, but they didn't have any tactics. Well, that's because they were, they were millennium in their thinking. In other words, they were thinking that they had to die because that's what the book of Revelations predicted. Then why did they arm themselves? In other words, they were just waiting to die. 
Well, that's a normal human reaction. If, if you read everything that they say, if you look at the tape that we have here, if you listen to how they talk, it's very clear that they did not expect to ever leave that place. Very clear. Because I, I would have thought that on the first day when they attacked, that had Koresh pushed out any flank, left or right, at an angle. If Koresh had shown, and, and this is my opinion, I believe that if Koresh had known uh, any uh, basic military tactics, and specifically the the philosophy that no defense can be justified in in the face of a constant attack, that all defenses can be overcome. Uh, and if he had mounted some kind of attack, there would have been terrible casualties on the on the federal side. Oh yeah, it, it was obvious, and and that's kind of what I've been looking at, and, uh, and that is that. I don't think, I, I hear a lot of people talking, not necessarily you, I, I know people, and they're talking about, you know, getting their, their military stuff together, and, and, and they're ready to do it, they're talking themselves, and they're ready to do it, but I don't think that they, I think they're very short on tactics. Well, they may be, and that's something they have to deal with. We're certainly not. Well, but I, I, would, I would certainly hope that you, you guys have looked back in your military history and are starting to look at things like small unit operations during the uh, war between the states. Well, I, I can't tell you what we're prepared to do or what our tactics are, but I can tell you that we <laughs> are not only prepared uh, supply-wise, but we are prepared uh, in every other way. Well, supplies, are, yeah, and we I'm, have, glad to, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, may I make a suggestion? And that is to look into uh, things like, uh, oh, in general, um, uh, Sherman's raid through Georgia and some of the resistance he met and how he dealt with that because it's also, I think, very important for people to know what type of resistance they're going to come up against. You know, just what will the government do? Will the, will the government just ignore northeastern Arizona, basically? You know, uh, just cut you out. You know, that's what Castro does. But he used to have rebels. Well, you have to understand that you're talking to two things here. You're talking to the militia of Arizona. I belong to the Second Continental Army of the Republic. Same thing. No, it's, not, I, I know it's, it's not the same. It's not the same thing, believe me. Well, they're two different organizations, but but yes. how they're going to treat you guys will be, be all about the same. No, I, I don't think that it'll be about the same. I don't think that there's going to be... I don't think there's anybody who's prepared for what the Second Continental Army of the Republic is prepared to do and can do, and for the I don't think that they have any conception of the brains that that are on our command staff. But anyway, that's all I can talk about. Okay, with well, you. and we're out of time. Uh, Good night, and thank you for calling. Good night, folks. Sorry, we got to end now because I'd love to stay and talk to to all of the good people that that called tonight and, and the ones who are probably trying to dial in. And uh, God bless you all. Jesus.